Hi everyone, this is the video from module 3 that is on ionic compounds. Uh, we're going to be working on uh, both nomenclature and formula writing here. So here we're going to be dealing with ionic compounds. We talked before about how to differentiate to make sure you know that it's an ionic compound. Now we're going to be looking at uh, writing formulas and naming ionic compounds. Now remember there's more than one type and so we really have to focus on um, both binary and polyatomic ion containing and then we're also going to be working a little bit with um, acids and bases here. Now when we're dealing with one type of ionic compound it really is just going to be, we call it, I call it type 1, um, I think that's pretty standard, but it really just means you have a main group metal and you have an ion. Um, anion, anion. You have a main group metal cation and an anion. Here we're going to name the cation first by name using the element name. So you're going to name the metal by its name. Then you're going to name the anion second. You're going to name it by the root of the anion name, but you're going to change the N to ide. So this is potassium and chlorine. We would name this potassium chloride. That one letter difference chlorine to chloride, the N to a D. This means that it is an ion. It's an ionic compound. Um, MgO. This is mag Mg is magnesium. Oxygen becomes oxide. Na2S. Na is sodium. Sulfur becomes sulfide. We are not dealing with the numbers. It doesn't matter. There's only one way for these guys to come together. All we have to do is name them by their name. Now, here's where, what I mean. How do I know that there's only one way to write these formulas? Well, I typically make a table. Now remember that when we're dealing with ionic compounds, we have ions. We need to know how many or the number of each, and we need to talk about the charge of each. And the idea is that the total positive and total negative charges should add up to be zero. Neutral compounds have zero charge. And so if we have sodium, phosphide comes from phosphorus, IDE. We just change it back to phosphorus. Now, sodium is in group one. So it's got a plus one charge. Phosphorus is in group five. Now, let me see. No. If we go to here, phosphorus is right here. So remember it's plus one, plus two, plus three, skip one, three minus. So because it's in group five, it has a three minus charge here. So this has got a three minus charge. Now I got that from the periodic table. Now I have to figure out, well, how am I going to cancel these? And the way that you think about it is by looking for the lowest common denominator. Okay. Well, if I want to cancel, the lowest I can get here is a three. So the lowest between three and one is three. If I had one phosphorus, but three sodiums, three times a positive one is plus three. 1 times a minus 3 is minus 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. And so this gives us a nice neutral compound. Now when you go to write the formula, your numbers are already there, the ones that you want to include as subscripts. So this is going to be Na3P. We don't write the one, it's understood. So that's our formula. Sodium phosphate, I'm sorry, sodium phosphide is Na3P. Now let's look at calcium nitride. Ions, number, charge in total. Here we've got calcium. Nitride comes from nitrogen. Calcium is in group two, so it's got a two plus charge. Nitrogen is in group five, so it's got a three minus charge. Here we want to make it so that it is going to be neutral again. Okay? So 
lowest common denominator between 2 and 3 is 6. So we have, we need 3 calciums and 2 nitrogens. 3 times 2 is plus 6. 2 times 3 is minus 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. So our formula here is going to be Ca subscript 3 N subscript 2. Now the way that I would write this in, in MOM, or my open math, is CA, capital C, lowercase a. If you start capitalizing the wrong letters, it should not take it. Underscore 3, capital N, underscore 2. You have to indicate these subscripts or it is not going to be right. This is aluminum. Oxygen becomes oxide, so this is aluminum oxide. Potassium and bromine, this becomes potassium bromide. Now, not everything is always that straightforward. Occasionally, we have some compounds with transition metals. Now, transition metals are both the ones that are here in this short stack, and then they're also the ones um, down here underneath the... Uh, uh, metalloids. And so specifically tin and lead we want to go ahead and, and pay attention to here. So whenever we're dealing with this, because iron for example can be plus two, iron can be plus three, we have to actually specify what the charge is because otherwise we're not going to know how to write the formula. It's going to be really confusing. And so there's a way to do that where we are including it um, within the context of the name itself. Now guys, I have to tell you, before this process where we had Roman numerals to indicate charge, it was so confusing. Um, this was come up, came, this was invented, this system, the new system is what they call it. I, was, I think it's Guyton, I don't know how to say it, it's G-U-Y-T-O-N, um, but in the mid-18th century, he was really tired of the fact that nobody called compounds by a specific name. You could have six or seven names for <laughs> the same compound, and nobody really had to agree, and so it came out to, instead of memorizing five rules, you had to memorize everything that existed. And so ferric, ferrous, uh, was invented in the mid-18th century. And then with the IUPAC system, we ended up changing uh, the ending more to Roman numerals instead. So, okay. So now, when we're dealing with binary ionic compounds, this is gonna have a transition metal, or which includes the metals under the metalloids, um, specifically tin and lead. And these are going to be named where the charge of the metal is specified with a Roman numeral. So you're going to name the, the cation or the metal by its element name, specify the charge by using a Roman numeral, and name the anion by changing the root of its element name, using the root of the element name and changing the ending to ide. Fe FeCl2 is iron 2 chloride. Guys, there's not two irons here. It has nothing to do with the number. It has to do with the charge. It's the charge. If you do not write, understand that the transition metal charge is what you write as that Roman numeral and not the number of ions themselves, it's going to be confusing. So this 2 means that the charge of the iron in this compound is 2 plus. Manganese 2 oxide, again, it only has to do with the fact that manganese had a 2 plus charge before it formed this compound. Copper 1 sulfide. Copper had a plus 1 charge before it formed this neutral compound. Now, I will specify this, guys. Um, zinc and silver are not like other transition metals. Here, they only have one charge. So a lot of the time, you're not going to see Roman numerals for zinc and silver compounds. Um, but you do need to do it for the metals that are under the metalloids. Now if we go back for a second, if we look at all of these, chromium can be plus one, charge of two plus, charge of three plus, 
all the way up to chromium-6. Most of them, though, are either going to be plus 1 or plus 2, or, in the case of iron, 2 plus or 3 plus. And so we have to really specify which one it is. It's just a matter of what's the easiest way. Hey, let's use Roman numerals. So let's go into some of these. If we look at nickel one oxide, how on earth are we going to know the formula here? Well, let's make our table again. Ion, number, charge, and total. Here we know we're using nickel, and we know we're using oxygen. We know that the compound must be neutral so that the total charges have to add up to be zero. Now, nickel one, this means that the charge of, I'm sorry, that didn't show up. Nickel is a plus one charge. Oxygen is in group six, so it's a two minus charge. In order to cancel this, the lowest common denominator is two, so we're gonna need two nickels, one oxygen, <laughs> which is going to give us 2 times 1 is plus 2, 1 times minus 2 is minus 2. All right, it's NI subscript 2, oh, capital N, lowercase i, subscript 2, capital O. Oh. For chromium 6 sulfide, this is chromium and sulfur. We know that chromium has a charge of 6 plus because it's in group uh, because it tells us it's the Roman numeral. Sulfur has a charge of 2 minus because it's in group 6. Lowest common denominator here is 6. So we just need one chromium, three sulfurs, 1 times 6 is <laughs> plus 6, 3 times 2 is minus 6. This is actually adding so we can put it in front. 6 minus 6 is 0. So this is CR, we don't write the 1, S Three. Oh my goodness, those dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so then if we look at, come on at these guys. This is VO2. Again, we can name vanadium and we can change the name of oxygen to oxide, but we need to know the charge here. And again, guys, your table is going to be where you go. Okay, here we have ion, number, charge, and total, V and O. We know that we have one vanadium and two oxygens from our subscripts. And we know that the total charges have to add up to be zero. We also know that the charge of oxygen is minus two because it is in group six. That gives us a total negative charge of four. In order to cancel to get to zero, this must be plus four. Four plus charge on only one vanadium, four divided by one. It, oh, actually it should be four plus, like that. So this is vanadium four, oxygen becomes oxide. Now, Fe3N2, same concept here. We've got iron and nitrogen. We know it has to add up to be zero. There's three irons, two nitrogens. Charge on nitrogen has to be minus three because it's in group five. Gives us a total of negative six. To cancel, this is going to be plus 6. 6 over 3 ions, 6 divided by 3 is going to be 2 plus. So this is iron 2 nitride. When you have a polyatomic ion, um, honestly, you just name the polyatomic ion by its name. If you have a regular main group metal, you name it by its element name. If you have a transition metal, you have to include the Roman numeral. If you have a ammonium, you just name the anion the same way that you would for 
uh, any other compound, the ending changes to ide. And so it's going to be important, guys, with your spelling. The difference between, um, well, here, look at this. This is copper one sulfite. This is copper one sulfate. And this is copper one sulfide. The difference in the ending, that one letter difference, I to A, um, T to D, changes the entire formula here. And so that is why you really need to memorize those polyatomic ions, okay? Now, I don't expect you to, you know, get the name the way I did really, really fast, but let's look at this for a minute, okay? I just want to point out the, the importance of spelling. So how do I know that this is copper one sulfite ion number charge in total? This is copper, and then we have the sulfite ion. Sulfite has a two minus charge. You know this because you memorized it. You have your flashcards of these. We have two coppers and one sulfite ion. Uh, there's no parentheses indicating more than one, so it's just one sulfite. That gives us a total negative of minus two. In order to make a, t a neutral compound, our total positive must be plus two. Two divided by two is gonna be a plus one charge. So this is copper one, copper one sulfite, okay? Oops. Ammonium and then chlorine becomes chloride. This is potassium carbonate. No Roman numeral because it is not a transition metal. Okay, so let's do this. What is the formula for? This is always a good time, guys, to go ahead and hit pause. Try to do it on your own. You're setting yourself up for success when you challenge yourself like that. Ion, number, charge, and total. We have manganese and peroxide. We know manganese has a plus five charge because it tells us right there. Peroxide is two minus because we have that memorized. So in order to get to the lowest common denominator to make sure that we have a nice neutral compound, we need to go to 10. Five and two, lowest common is 10. So we're gonna use two mang manganese and five peroxides. Two times five is plus 10. 5 times a negative 2 is minus 10. 10 minus 10 is 0. So this is going to be Mn2 O2. Oh, wait a minute. We have more than one polyatomic ion here, guys. We can't just write it like this because that looks like there's 25 oxygens. That's not right. What we really have is five polyatomics. So we're going to put parentheses around our polyatomic ion and write a 5. For calcium cyanide, calcium cyanide, calcium is in group 2, so it's got a 2 plus charge. Cyanide is a 1 minus. So we need to go to the lowest common denominator to get to a neutral compound. So this is going to be 1 and 2. 1 times 2 is plus 2. 2 times 1 is minus 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. So this is Ca. We don't have to write the 1. Cn. We can't write the 2 because that looks like two nitrogens and not like the two cyanides. So when you have more than one polyatomic ion and only more than one polyatomic ion, you close it in parentheses and add a subscript to. This is the ammonium ion. Chlorine becomes chloride. So this is ammonium chloride. This is potassium. This is the hydroxide ion. Hydroxide is OH with the minus one charge overall. Um, it's the one that we're going to talk about primarily with bases in a minute. Now, the last type of um, ionic compounds we really need to talk about 
are acids and bases. Acids are ionic compounds whose formula begins with H. Here, you're, what we're going to find out later is that you have an H plus that's donated to solution. It can really be um, kind of caustic, uh, you know, although really almost everything we deal with is slightly acidic. Now, binary acids are going to be two, uh, two atoms. You have an H and then some kind of nonmetal anion. Um, there's no oxygen. So when we name these, we name it by beginning with the prefix hydro, the root of the anion's name, and end with ic acid. So HCl, there's no oxygen, so hydro, chlor from chlorine, ic acid. <sighs> Hold on. Titan, shut up! Um, okay. So same thing here, H2S. Here we've got no oxygen, so this is hydro, sulf from sulfur, ic acid. Titan, buddy, you're fine. When you have acids that contain an oxygen, specifically from a polyatomic ion, they're going to be called oxyacids. Um, really, we don't care about that. All we care about is the naming rules. Here, the, if the anion, you're going to use the root of the anion name. So like sulfate, sulfite, uh, carbonate, per, iodate, that kind of thing. Um, if the anion originally ended in 8, you're going to change the ATE to ic acid. So this isn't hydrogen sulfate because it's an acid, so we're not going to deal with that. This is, instead of sulfate, sulfuric acid. This is not carbonate anymore. It is carbonic acid. If the ending originally was ite, we're going to change that to us acid. So this is not sulfite. This is sulfurous acid. Okay. Now bases are going to be any ion that contains hydroxide. Hydroxide is just OH minus. It is probably one of the most used ions uh, this semester. Um, it doesn't have any trends. It's just hydroxide. So follow the rules when you see it for naming hydroxides, or polyatomic ions, I'm sorry. Hydrocyanic acid. Hmm. Well, I'm going to go with ion, number, charge, and total. I know that it's going to be um, an, an acid. I'm sorry. I know it's an ionic compound because it's an acid. Acids have to have an H. Cyan came from cyanide. Charge on H is plus one, or one plus because it's in group one. On cyanide it's one minus because it's, well you memorized it. Um, so to balance this we just need one of each and that's going to give us our charges here. So this is HCN. No parentheses because there's only one cyanide. Um, there you go. For calcium hydroxide Ca and OH. This is in group 2, so it's 2 plus charge. This is minus 1 because you've got it memorized, so you need 1 and 2. 1 times 2 is plus 2. 2 times 1 is minus 2. That adds up to give us our 0, so it's a neutral compound. This is going to be Ca, more than one polyatomic, so parentheses, OH2. Phosphoric acid. Acid means it starts with H. Phos there's no hydro, so it's not an element here. Um, instead, because there's a lacking a hydro prefix, phosphoric had to come from phosphate. So PO4. This is from plus one. This is going to be minus three because you've got it memorized. Guys, I have a an activity in a minute that's going to really give you tons of practice. Just Bear with me for a few more minutes. Um, so here we're going to need lowest common denominator is 3. So we're going to need 3 hydrogens, 1 phosphate. 3 times 1 is plus 3. three 1 times a negative 3 is minus 3. That's going to give us a, our nice neutral compound. So this is H3PO4 for phosphoric acid. Now let's look down here at these. Barium is a metal, and we have a polyatomic ion. So this is an ionic compound. 
Now, barium is not a transition metal, so we don't need to specify the charge at all. So we can just name this uh, barium by its name, hydroxide by its name, so it's barium hydroxide. This is an acid, it's an ionic compound that starts with H, so it has to be an acid. It contains an oxygen, so to name this, we're going to look at the polyatomic. NO3 minus is nitrate, so nitrate becomes nitric acid. NO2 is nitrite, nitrite becomes nitrous acid. Guys, let me show you a shortcut for that. Um, the way that I remember this is um, if you've ever eaten something and then you felt icky, ate ick, oops, or after you do this for long enough, you typically feel sick. So you might have an it us, you know, the itis. Um, so eight ick itis. That's how I remember it. Last type of naming is hydrates. Now, technically, I don't usually include this on um, the test because it gets kind of hard uh, to have that many parts. But I want you to see where you might encounter this. Hydrates are molecules that are surrounded by water, but it's not really bonded there. And so what you end up having is like the ions at a molecular level, and then you have water that just kind of surrounds it. And it's just a way of stabilizing it, especially for hydroscopic compounds um, or desiccants. And so it just kind of acts as a unit. And you can usually tell if it's got water involved, because if you look, like sometimes you see this really nice powdery substance, kind of like the way flour looks versus things like um, this where you can tell like there's there's definitely some crystalline water and stuff in there. Um, so these are much more, I'm doing quotation marks, but wet crystals. Um, they just have water there. Now places you see this are things like here. This is magnesium sulfate and then it has surrounded by water. So you name it as a hydrate by including a prefix to indicate the number. So this is magnesium sulfate hepta for seven hydrate. This is actually um, Epsom salts. Readily available at the pharmacy. Um, if you look at the active ingredient, or really it should be like the only ingredient, it's magnesium sulfate hepta hydrate. Um, if you take, uh, you know, later courses, sometimes you get to kind of try and remove the water from it. And it really, if you, if you take Epsom salt and you heat it slowly over in lab, over a Bunsen burner, um, you can kind of watch it go from this nice crystalline over to a powdery substance. Um, cal CaCl2, this is calcium chloride, not a Roman numeral because there's no transition metal here. Two waters, so dihydrate. Um, copper sulfate, we would have to indicate the number. Copper sulfate, we have to indicate the charge, so number, charge, total. There's one and one. This has got a two minus charge. Um, I don't want to write over my writing, but which means this has to be a two plus. So it's copper, two, sulfate, and then penta for five, hydrate. Now guys, the other place that you will encounter these is um, usually at like Home Depot or Lowe's or other home uh, improvement stores, they will use these as desiccants. And so a desiccant is something that will really absorb all the water out of the air, remove moisture from the air. So if you have um, like a mold under your sink, it is a really nice thing because you can get things like damp red, which is really just, um, I think this is their active ingredient and it pulls the water out of the air, it holds it in the bucket, and then you can go dump it and, you know, start over. And the idea is then you don't have mold, you just have a better, healthier environment. So um, they also use uh, desiccants in pretty much anything new you buy, like backpacks or, um, well, things. They usually put a little desiccant pack in there so that if there is moisture in the air, it doesn't get moldy. Now, two things I want to say. 
Um, at this point, guys, we've talked about a lot of name, nomenclature. Now, what's really cool is you guys can start going to your food labels and your shampoo bottle. And even though you don't, you won't know the nomenclature for organic compounds until the end of the semester, you already have a really good basis to start seeing what these compounds are that you encounter on a regular basis. Um, two quick notes, guys. Um, one, nutritional chemists do not always use the proper nomenclature, so be careful that you are using Roman numerals when they need them. Um, but you will start to see that. The other thing I want to point out, uh, discard, is if you go back for a second, where did it go? This one? Yeah. If you are going truly into the medical field, if you're thinking about pharmacy school, if you're thinking about nursing, the uh, Guyton nomenclature system is still kind of in place for uh, those two fields. And so this might not always be iron two. You'll end up dealing with ferrous and ferric sometimes um, where you use the endings to indicate what the charge is. Um, but typically you deal with that in nursing and pharmaceutical chemistry. We are going to stick to straight IUPAC. Say what it is by the number. I just want you to know that that is something you may see in your field. Discard. Okay, so let's go down here for a minute. Now, the other thing I want to point out is I have this nice flow chart. So if you're trying to figure out how on earth do I name this compound, here's a flow chart for that. Does the compound start with an H? So like, let's just... Let's do that. Hmm... and something like that. So if we looked at this, HBr, this starts with an H. So it's an acid. Woo! Is there oxygen? No. So you're going to name hydro, root of the element name, and then ic acid. So this is hydro, brome, ic acid. Let's look at one of these. Oops. There we go. Does the compound start with H for this one? No, it does not. Does the compound contain a metal? Yes. Is there a transition metal? No. Okay, so name the cation by its element name and name the polyatomic ion by its name. So this is sodium carbonate. TiNO3, does it start with H? No. Does it have a transition metal or a polyatomic? Yes. Is there a transition metal? Yes. So here we would name titanium with a Roman numeral indicating its charge, nitrate. This would end up being titanium 2 nitrate. Um, and so really that's going to be kind of how you use this. We can do the same thing with the uh, name going to, oops, with the name going to compounds. Um, here, does the name include acid? Yes, and it must start with an H. Um, is there hydro that tells you whether or not there's a polyatomic ion or not? Does the compound contain prefixes? If not, it's ionic. If so, it's covalent. And so you kind of can go through this as you're learning the nomenclature to really kind of brush up. Now, the next video is all about the in-class activity I usually provide, and that's where you're going to get a lot of your practice here.